You're listening to the Curious About Cannabis podcast. The Curious About Cannabis podcast is brought to you by the generous support of fans just like you. Find out how you can support the show and get access to exclusive content, merchandise discounts, and more at patreon.com slash curious about cannabis. If you want to learn even more about cannabis, check out the Curious About Cannabis book at cacpodcast.com slash book, or check out our Curious About Cannabis online courses and educational events at the Natural Learning Academy at learn.naturalledu.com. Hey everybody, this is Jason Wilson with the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. So today I'm really, really excited to be joining somebody who had kind of been casually following some of their work over the past uh, six months, a year or so, and then finally reached out and we got connected. But I'm here with Alicia Ratliff. Uh, Alicia, thanks so much for being willing to come on the podcast to talk about all. Absolutely. I'm sure there's tons and tons you've learned in your experience uh, that we'll get into, but a, a tiny bit of background to our listeners. Alicia is a scientist similar to myself. We actually have very similar backgrounds in certain ways uh, as far as analytical science and stuff goes. And then she, like myself, got wrapped up into this world of of cannabis and cannabis science. And uh, so and and you're in the southeast, uh, although not for long. Um, So that's another (laughs) another little little connection between us that always gets me excited to find folks in the uh, southeast that are um, doing great work and kind of building that region. So. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. And uh, I guess to to kick things off, um, do you mind, you know, I already alluded to your background, but do you mind sharing, um, I'll just kind of not start at the very beginning, but, um, you know, I think a lot of people know that you're a chemist, but maybe they don't know that you were doing like analytical chemistry and all sorts of different stuff like that before you got into extraction, which is kind of really what you're known for now. Um, so just take us back a little bit and tell us kind of your story and, and how things kind of got to where they are now. Sure. Um, again, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm super excited that you reached out and connected and I'm excited to just share whatever insights and perspective I can to all the listeners today. So thanks so much, Jason. Um, so yeah, I have uh, quite a bit of experience in laboratory operations. I graduated about 11 years ago. Uh, with my bachelor's in chemistry. And right out of the gate, I started working for an environmental company doing extractions for uh, the EPA and the FDA on uh, water and soil testing. So um, I was able to get a lot of experience there with um, extraction technique, wet chemistry techniques. I was able to develop methods for uh, different technology to optimize extractions. Uh, We were doing some dinosaur methods and some antiquated sonication. So I was able to bring in some microwave technology, sock slit technology, which was really good there. Um, And then I moved into um, analysis and running uh, GC mass spec, analyzing um, full list 8270s, uh, pesticides, anything, you know, micro and macro molecules that you would find in water and soil. Um, So that was quite interesting for me. And I spent some time there, Uh, but then I moved on and started working in a contract analytical laboratory where we did uh, big studies for um, larger CROs like Bayer, Syngenta, uh, BASF, um, similar to some of the pesticides and the fungicides that you would see on shelves in Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, We were the laboratory that was uh, studying the analytes and what their preservation rates were and um, how they dissipated into different crops and what those residues look like. Um, So that was quite interesting work that I did there. And I actually um, came out of the lab in that um, role where I was doing a lot of uh, project management and liaising between customers and clients and what the laboratory was doing. And that was really um, a a challenging experience in trying to explain technical chromatograms and data to non-scientists. Um, it's not the easiest language to speak. Uh, I'm sure that you're well aware of that in this industry, that it's not yes. very easy. Um, but yeah, that was a really interesting role to kind of get my my wheels going on the business operations side, along with the scientific technical side. Um, and then about five years ago, I remember talking with my husband about this, you know, green rush that was happening. And I was uh, very similar to Sanjay Gupta in my perspective of cannabis at the time. Like, I just thought, you know, stoners dealt with it. It was bad for you. You should never get into this type of thing. 
And here I am married to someone who is a very happy cannabis connoisseur. And he's just like, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. You need to research this a little more. And I did. And I started to see like how uh, scientific the industry really is when you think about it. You know, in the beginning, there was so much to be learned when the Green Rush and the pilot program started happening out West and you had a lot of safety challenges, you had um, technology challenges, um, little to no automation. So I was able to really do a lot of research and, and see that, wow, this is a space that I, I can see myself not only penetrating, but also, you know, growing within this space. And ever since, you know, I just, I'm really happy I made that jump because I'm able to wear so many different hats in the roles that I've taken on and my knowledge base just as a chemist, as a scientist has really grown and blossomed and it, it just happens every single day. I love it. I love what I do. <laughs> yeah. And you seem like a person that really likes wearing a lot of hats. So you, I do. you seem like, yeah, you like to uh, be working on a lot. Of, I'm kind of similar like that. I like to have a lot of projects and different things kind of going and always been involved in startups and so it's yeah it's an interesting interesting world and absolutely i i connect to what you're talking about as far as how do you take what's happening in the lab and and get your your customers to understand you know that you're not just providing data but there's a lot of nuance to that data and you know how do they apply that data that's something that is you know it's one of the big things that when i was working in in analytical labs in the space you know it's because at the time we were building a startup. So once again, wearing all the hats and so lots of conversations with customers, like, you know, what are you trying to do with your data? Like, you know, okay, you're getting cannabinoid terpene testing, but what's the point? What do you actually, sure. the end goal? Um, and it's, it's been a fun process. And what did that transition look like for you when you decided that um, the cannabis space, you know, was, was interesting and you, you had this really awesome skill set and everything to bring to it. Um, what was kind of the first steps that you took to make that change? Uh, well, you know, the best analogy that I can use or, you know, visual is, you know, have you, if you've ever watched Twilight and I, I'm such a nerd for that, I know I am, <laughs> but I love Twilight. And if you've ever watched Twilight and, Bella is on that cliff and she's, you know, freaking out because Edward's gone and he's left her and all these different things. And she just jumps. Yeah. And she, there's just, there's no parachute. There's no lifeboat in the water. There's, there's nothing. And she has to figure out, you know, how am I going to get out? She got saved, but I didn't have that experience. And honestly, that is what it was like transitioning from your normal um, standardized laboratory operation into a startup chaotic. Uh, I don't know much about the plant. I don't know much about the extraction technology. It was literally like me jumping off of a cliff and having to figure out very quickly, either I'm going to be a champion swimmer or I'm going to grow wings and I'm going to fly. And so it, it was just so interesting, the level, you know, of all of the different things that came into the, the first role that I took in the industry. Um, I was a laboratory director. And when I took the role, you know, I went through a series of interviews with the VP of Ops. And here I am thinking in my mind, oh, it's a startup. So, you know, they, they have a building. They probably have a couple pieces of equipment. They just need me to come in and, and kind of polish some things up, you know, hire some people, train them and all these different things. And, oh, my God, was I wrong? Like, it was just... <laughs> It was intense, Jason. It was literally, I walked into a building that had been freshly demoed and all I was standing in was dirt. <laughs> dirt and a big table, a fold-out table with these huge yes. plans all over it. And I'm looking at him like a deer in headlights, like, what do you expect me to do with this? You know, I'm a chemist. I, I need a beaker, an Erlenmeyer flask, something. <laughs> I'll <laughs> tell you, I'll tell you what, what, what equipment to get, but uh, I can't build the Yeah, floor. <laughs> exactly. So I'm, you know, I'm really ambitious. I, I love challenges. I love for, you know, people to tell me, no, you can't do that. So that it can force me to show them, yes, I can. And I remember going home with a copy of those plans a little bit of tears dried up on my face. Yep. And I, I talked to my husband and I'm like, I have to build this building. I have to actually manage the contractors. I have to manage, you know, vetting the equipment and how it's going to fit into this building process flow wise, you know, electrical, the irrigation, like everything is involved. 
And I studied, I studied my butt off to understand blueprints and how to read those blueprints and how to interpret what my needs were from a visualization point of view to the contractors that were going to execute that. And I, I really found that if you're open in your communication, if you are uh, honest and transparent with what you don't know, people are much more willing to collaborate with you and, and help you get to where you need to go. And that build out was really the start of me finding my, my niche in the industry. It was the fun part. I love being able to have this blank canvas and just kind of paint it, you know, and, and actually paint it the right way because I came from, you know, a very standardized and high compliance, high regulated environment. So that is just ingrained in me anyway. And it was a total success. It was great. And now five years later, I have four build outs under my belt, uh, two that are virtual Quickly integrated uh, one that was just the processing facility and I, I keep going and it's just like they're, they're like babies you know you have these babies and there's a part of you that's that's there um, and that's not even touching on the staff like I oh that's one of my favorite parts <laughs> just the people the people element oh the people pieces you know it's just a big deal because like myself you know I came in as an infant I came in not really knowing much about, you know, cultivars and the different uh, science between the phenotypes and, and the genetics and, and what you're looking for, for optimal yields on the extraction methods that you're using. I, I had to learn a lot and I had to teach myself a lot of those things because unfortunately I didn't have a lot of scientists that were in leadership or on those boards to be able to mentor me. So I've really taken on this, you know, this role of, okay, not only am I going to direct processing or, you know, do extraction and analytical, I'm going to mentor a lot of these people coming into the industry so that we can level up that generation of scientists that's, you know, behind me. And I've just had so much success in, you know, really walking the walk and, and being there hands on in the, you know, boots on the ground, in the lab with my crew, explaining why we're doing this, why we're changing these parameters. And I get so much respect and, and motivation and productivity out of people just being there with them and, and teaching them and helping grow their knowledge base too. So I, I feel like that's been my favorite part of being in this industry, honestly. Yeah. And it's, it's cool. Uh, Cause I've been in sort of similar situations like that where you, you get to train and, and mentor while, while things are being built. And something that I always love is seeing the, the amount of pride that people really start to take in their work as they understand what they're doing and what they're contributing mm -hmm. and they're learning. And so the value they're getting out of it is more than just the paycheck, but the, the experience and the knowledge and, and everything. And if, if it's done right and it doesn't always work out, but when it's done right, you see this glow that comes from, you know, them understanding how they fit in this big picture and, and what you're all working on, um, together. And I, that's something I, I love as well. Um, it's just really, oh, absolutely. I really love when, when I hire a staff, I have a, a very specific way that I train. I love to, uh, train completely. So, you know, most of the facilities that I've run have started with, uh, inbounding material and going through all of the preparation of that material for extraction and then any post-processing, then the analytical piece, then the manufacturing yeah. and then the distribution. And what I do is I will hire a staff, a startup team, and I will train them on every single SOP throughout the building. And we will work as a team throughout the building. And something so beautiful happens to where there's a natural gravitation towards their strengths yes. and their interests. Yeah. And so I'm able to find that, okay, I'll train everybody up, but then they naturally gravitate towards what they're really interested in. And then I end up with specialized people. I end up with my extraction artists. I end up with my analytical gurus. I end up with my formulation experts. And it's not a mandated type of situation. So you're able to really get that uh, interest and that buy-in into what it is that we're doing every day. And that care is there you know, for the consumer on the back end. That care is there. And it's just such a wonderful thing to experience. Yeah, and you're highlighting a really important piece that I think goes contrary to a lot of kind of uh, old school conventional kind of business management philosophies, which is um, when you're hiring people, you don't always know what people's secret strengths are, and they may not even know. You know, sometimes they don't necessarily, you know, they may think they're good at one thing, but then when you get them exposed to something else, all of a sudden, you know, mm -hmm. you, you see all these other skills and talents come out. It's something... Um, 
there's a quality management guru that I like a lot, um, W. Edwards Dimming. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with with him or not, but he he always talked about this too that that you know when you're when you're managing projects and building out teams, you always have to account for the fact that there are secret talents that people have, and if you can find ways to pull those out and get those people. Uh, you know, exposed to enough things that you you as a manager can recognize it and then help them, you know, on that path. That's so much, uh, if it's, once again, if it's done well and with the right intention, that can work out so much better than saying, okay, I have a need for uh, an analytical technician. And so then you go and look through resumes for analytical technician, you know, it's mm-hmm. just, um, and I think this is just related to the experience of startups. I think it's a unique opportunity that startups have to experiment with some of these kind of more, I don't even consider it like alternative business management practices, but it's, I mean, to me, it's just, uh, I don't know, it's it's just a more mindful, maybe. Uh, it is. Right? It's more mindful. It's more sustainable. You know, it's it's honestly like I know myself and I know I could not you know, not putting any shame on anyone that's operating HPLCs day in and day out. And that's what they do. Um, But for me, that just, that wasn't enough. You know, it it wasn't fulfilling enough. So I think when you're mindful of who people are and and when they come in the door, you know, I have a pretty good eye and ear at this point of being able to discern people during the interview process and know, okay, you are very shy right now on what your real strength is. I'm going to bring that out of you. You just wait. It's going to be three months. And I, I kid you not, I've had people sit across from me and be worried because they don't have a degree. Mm-hmm. They don't have, you know, the, the scientific uh, knowledge background that maybe myself, yourself, or someone else that's competing for that spot. But for me, it's not always the case. You know, if I'm looking at your past and let's say you've been working in a laboratory, you understand, you know, uh, what chemistry techniques and things I can train you, I can teach you. And there are people who I've hired who did not have those credentials and literally are troubleshooting and taking apart HPLC mass specs as we speak. And it is just, you know, mind blowing that I'm able to, to you know, see these things during the interview process and say, okay, this is going to be necessary on the team. Because like you said, in a startup environment, it is quite different from your traditional business operations aspect. You are going to run into problems every single day. And if you do not diversify your staff, you're going to be left with people who cannot contribute any type of solution, ideas. I love to have a collaborative leadership style. I love sitting down with my team and saying, guys, We've hit a problem. We have hit a problem. This is what it looks like. These are my thoughts on it. What's the what's the room consists? Of? What what can we do about this? And it again furthers that buy-in of what we're doing as a company, but it also gives them that valuable piece of feeling recognized and knowing that their voice is heard. And that's something that, you know, is really suffering in this industry. I know it's in a lot of industries, but specifically in my experience in the canvas industry, it's it's difficult you know, to feel recognized and valued when you're moving at the speed of light, you know, you've got to get products out, money has to be made. And, and that's sometimes the core value. And unfortunately, that's not the best for, you know, for the team. Yeah, absolutely. And and this all perfectly segues into, um, you know, some of the things I really wanted to get into with you. And we'll start with this one, which is what are some of the primary lessons um, that you've learned from, you know, let's say those first two or, you know, one or two projects that you took on that have, you know, affected the way that you approach projects now um, and and I'm sure into the future, too. Well, I have a lot, honestly. Yeah, sure, like, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Like, I love talking about lessons learned because whatever I can share that can help someone else stop the pothole in the future is going to be, you know, that much more valuable. But one of the biggest pieces for me has been Uh, the lack of understanding that business plan from now until five years from now. And I think that there's a lack of forward thinking when it comes to when it comes to building out the the cannabis company, you know, whether that's a vertically integrated company or just uh, an entity in cultivation or processing or or retail, you have to think forward. You have to think, where am I going to be 
two years from now, three years from now, because there's going to be expansion uh, capabilities there that you may be restricted in your, your infrastructure. And then you may be looking at a large, you know, capital raising at that, at that point, because now you recognize, okay, we're doing better than we projected. Now we need to bring in an extra extractor. Now we need to add another 25,000 square foot greenhouse. You know, now we need to expand our dispensary because we have way too much volume to handle. Um, those are things I think from my first early on projects, you have to think forward. You have to say, am I going to always be here? And this is my product yield month over month. This is what I want to create and produce. Or do you want to see yourself growing into a larger entity, a larger brand, having more brand recognition across your market? Maybe that market's going to extend into other states. Maybe it's going to extend globally if you're in the hemp space, you know. Um, so I think that's a huge, a huge lesson learned that people really just don't think forward enough to be able to account for it with their infrastructure built. Um, and that's really an easy one to, to think about in the, in the beginning. Uh, I, I stress, you know, I'm a licensed project manager, so I really stress spending the most time during your planning and initiation phase. You have to spend that time in the planning phase, just reiteration after reiteration of just going over any of the risks. How are we going to mitigate those risks? What do our expansions look like? What does the growth look like for, you know, not just the model itself, but the building, the people, you know, how are we going to manage a staff and still stay connected to them at 100 employees versus 20? Um, so those are things that you, you absolutely have to think about the growth of the business. Where am I going to be? Um, another lesson learned that I think is extremely important is the budget. <laughs> I think that a lot of the time people will see the huge dollar signs that this billion dollar industry can afford someone, you know, jumping into the market and grabbing a license and they will shortchange on their budget for their CapEx yeah. and their OpEx. And they'll, they'll look at it and they'll say, okay, I can cut corners here and, you know, maybe cut down on the salaries and save some money there. I can cut down on the automation of my equipment and only bring in this for now. I'm going to get started now. But then they don't think about how labor intensive a lot of these processes are when you are lacking that level of automation. I mean, back in the day with the CO2 extractors, for oh, instance, man, yeah. you would have to have literally two people in that room 24 seven or however long your shifts were operating, manually opening and closing the supply valve from yep. the CO2 into the extraction chamber, watching the pressures, manually going over the gauges there and, and, and having to you know make sure that you're at the proper operating levels for that. And if you're not, then now you gotta go back and you gotta mitigate that. And then you could have messed up your entire batch. So now that has to get redone or reprocessed. And that, it, it hits into your profit margins every single month. And if you're not mindful of those things, if you don't, I love like when I have projects approach me, I always tell them that you need to spend the most money in your equipment, your compliance piece of that equipment and your infrastructure and your staff. Yeah. That is where you're going to spend the most money. But unfortunately, I always see it flipped where mm -hmm. they'll spend the least amount of money in the compliance piece, yeah. the equipment and the staff. And then they'll go heavy on the cultivars that I want to grow. They'll go heavy on packaging, like all the packaging's got to look really great and badass. And then they'll go heavy on uh, marketing and yes. the marketing strategy and, and getting those things out there. Website will look fantastic. And then you'll show up to the actual site and it's this little 3,000 square foot makeshift warehouse thing where, you know, half of it got blown up last week because of the CO2 tubes are rubbing together and you got friction. You know, it's just, it's nice. You are, it, it doesn't make any sense. Yes, you are <laughs> describing things I have personally experienced. Um, yes, <laughs> I can concur with everything that you're saying. And especially like my my focus was sort of in the quality management and, and compliance piece mixed in with the analytical side and that I mm -hmm. struggled so hard to get clients to understand the value of figuring your quality management system out at the beginning rather than trying to implement it years later when yes. your culture has already been defined yes. your, your patterns of behavior are already there it is so hard to change all of that once it it's, is. it's set and I, I, I've heard the same thing. Well, no, we have to do this now so we can get running and then we'll come back to that. And, you know, what you were describing on the first point that you brought up 
of just the forward thinking, an exercise that I try to get my clients to do. It's a part of ISO 9001, but uh, context of the organization. So mm -hmm. what are your risks? What are your opportunities? What, um, who are your stakeholders? You know, mm -hmm. sometimes companies don't even think about that. Like they just mm -hmm. think, well, I mean, it's the people that work here and the people that run the company. Well, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. It's, it's, it's hard. And so how, how do you, how do you convince people to value those things? You know, it, it's difficult. It really is. And honestly, I have um, a very sharpshooter type of uh, directive towards that. You know, I don't sugarcoat things for people. I don't uh, take on projects that aren't willing to listen to me. Yeah. Um, if they're, you know, not willing to listen to the expertise that I've gained, you know, not only with the five years that I've been in the industry, but just as a whole, yeah. you know, as a scientist, then that to me is going to be a huge red flag in the relationship that we're starting. Um, quite a few people who are non-scientists think that they have it all figured out because they have, you know, excess capital or they've watched a couple YouTube videos where they think that they can make an acid-based reaction happen like this. You know, it's just... <laughs> You know, they, they look at you know, an HPLC, like a blender or a toaster yeah. where, you know, they're just going to put something in, hit a button and it's going to come out. And that has been such a huge uh, problem in trying to be very uh, forward with, with clients and let them know like, hey, I understand that you have an understanding, but it's wrong. And I'm so sorry that, you know, your mother didn't tell you you can't send and they let you go on the talent show. You know, that's just, that's what it is. And yeah. um, so I, I feel as if, you know, if you're very transparent, if you're extremely honest and you have data to back that up, that's one of the things that's different from our consulting firm and others that are out there. There's a lot of consulting firms that are out there literally Googling SOPs, mm -hmm. pasting and copying and putting them together and selling them for thousands and thousands of dollars to people and putting people at risk with their companies versus with me, I actually have hands-on experience running extractors of multiple manufacturers to tell you what the throughput's gonna be for CBD heavy material, for THC heavy material. What is it gonna look like to even fractionate during that process? Yeah. What are you gonna get when you go and you set up your uh, HPLC for potency? Where are those consumables? What's the throughput of that? You know, those are, I think that's real world data that will convince anyone if you can put it on paper and say, hey, here it is. This is the, the proof. And if you allow me to, I can show you um, a plan and a model that's going to get you to where you would like to be. But it's going to take you in a very methodical way. And it's also going to point out all of the pieces of compliance and, and regulatory um, considerations that you need to have operating in a what can be a risky and dangerous environment. You know, because a lot of people don't think about that. Um, I'm really happy at the strides that we've made just in extraction alone, mm -hmm. you know, from where it was uh, 20 years ago where people were blowing up every week, you know, in labs and garages in the middle of forests and, and all these different things doing open blasting extraction with hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. Now people are starting to really understand that this is a scientific space. It takes a level of knowledge and a level of consideration to compliance and safety and risk to understand what it is you're even getting in bed with. If you don't want to do those things, if you want to just play stoner scientist, then my recommendation is do it solventlessly. Yeah. You know, everybody can do it that way. And, and that way you're not putting anyone at risk. Um, you know, I have personally been like involved in an explosion. And it was nothing that we could have really predicted. It was just literally the way the extractor and the pump was set up. And there was friction happening between the hoses from the pump to the extractor to where one day it just spontaneously broke. Yeah. And there was a, a large combustion. And the nice thing is no one was in the facility at the time. This was an overnight run. And we had all of these different sensors to be able to shut things down whenever, uh, you know, you get to a certain level a maximum exposure level and you have your uh, firemen and everybody else your first responders that are coming on site immediately but again you have to plan for those things yes. you have to have a safety plan and say okay not if but when this happens what am i going to do about it to not only protect my product my business but my people yeah my people like that's the biggest piece so i, I do think you have to be transparent and very straightforward with people yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you said the, you know, how do I protect my people? Because um, I've seen all sorts of things um, among different operations that I've 
tried to help or you know visit it and things and there was one one thing that really stood out to me because it wasn't so obvious to me at the time but then looking back i'm like i yeah it makes perfect sense but um i was uh, working with a client that was doing co2 extraction and product manufacturing and stuff and they were not monitoring um the volatile volatile the vocs the volatile organic mm-hmm. uh compounds that were in the air and and also not thinking that terpenes are vocs um mm-hmm. and so there was actually one of the uh kind of lead scientists that was working in the facility actually got through long-term exposure having worked there for like a year and kind of breathing the stuff in started to develop symptoms started to develop mm. hypersensitivity headaches you know sick he'd have to leave the uh facility um at times and then it, it just and it and the sensitization got worse and worse and worse um and then when i started helping and i was instituted monitors to try to see you know just to get that feedback loop you know because how can you mm-hmm. respond if you don't know if you don't know yeah and and then you know you start to see these levels and everything and um you know and they, they didn't even have a monitor in their in their co2 room and i was just like ah, oh. like as a data person i'm like that's huge you've been operating <laughs> without any information any feedback for so long and putting your people at risk and that's what really uh you know why i was i was happy to jump in because i was like this is mm-hmm. about protecting your most important assets really which is these humans yeah. that, that have yeah. given up their time and energy you know to to work on this 100 um, percent mm-hmm. it's yeah I, I hope more people listening um uh really 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 think about that and and you know what's funny too it's like you know um all along this topic for some reason people will think that that extra mile that you need to go to make sure and ensure people are safe it doesn't cost that much. No, it re- it really doesn't. When you look at your overall budget for a project, when you're talking about having uh, proper ventilation in your decarb area, if you're decarbing your raw material or your oils, and you have proper ventilation and carbon filters for any type of um, mitigation of odors outside to the environment, those things are cheap. I've installed a carbon filter, a large, you know, twelve inch to sixteen inch yeah. filter within my system. For like eight grand, yeah, you know, like you're you're out here buying jet skis and stuff for that. It's it really isn't that expensive when you think about the safety piece and the compliance piece, and you just opt to do that on the front end. Then yes. it's gonna really save you on the back end when you have an audit or an inspection and something pops up and they say, "Hey, you're temporarily suspended for now until you address this." And it could be something as large as your your HVAC system needs to get updated. And now that's $200,000 to go across an entire 50,000 square foot facility. So it's like, why don't you budget that in first and and look at those things and make sure your investors are well aware of why the cost is this high. And they will, I mean, anyone that, that has a good mindset of, you know, keeping someone safe from making some money in an industry will look at that and say, oh, no brainer, yeah. no brainer. Of course we need to do that. Yeah, and and like you said, it really has to be on the front end because um, once you're knee deep in your business, and especially if you're in a you know the startup survival mentality, then it's like, wait, eight thousand dollars to update something? Well, uh, no, we'll we'll try to see if we can figure. You know, it just becomes this like extra burden when you're mm-hmm. in the thick of your operations and you're trying to retrofit things yes. to be what they should have been in the beginning. It's Super messy. And and something you you touched on just a minute ago, I wanted to make sure that we we focused on. You mentioned sustainability and that that's mm-hmm. that's been a focus of yours. Like when you're uh working with these build outs, trying to think about how do we uh both on a on a business level, but also an environmental level, human level, um, how do we do this in a sustainable way? So can you talk a little bit about your mindset there and, and what that typically looks like for you on on these different levels? Sure. So sustainability is a, a big hot topic in this industry. And not, in my opinion, I think a lot of people just throw it around because it's oh, like yeah. the word of the tw- you know 2020. But it's, it, it's really an, a very important aspect of any operation, any business. Um, you know, when you're thinking about process, when you're thinking about the environment, when you're thinking about people, you have to think about the level of waste that you're generating, how you're handling that waste, and are there any opportunities to be able to recycle? 
Yeah. Um, there's, you know, there's been companies that I've worked for where, you know, everything that we've done in the facility is closed loop, everything to where you have this constant recycling of solvents that you're using. If your extraction method is ethanol, if your extraction method is CO2, um, you're recycling those solvents. And not only is it not producing a lot of waste, it's also saving you on that consumable cost per month that you would be paying for a new supply every single month coming in. I don't know about you, but, you know, 200 proof organic grain ethanol is extremely expensive, especially in this industry where you don't have any you know, tax breaks for being in the cannabis space. You know, you can't just go and get your liquor license as an industrial processor if you're working in cannabis. Uh, hopefully we have some legislation on, on the horizon that's going to come and, and help break those barriers down. But until then, I mean, you're paying double the amount for a drum of ethanol that you would for excise tax. You know, so that's something that you really should think about whenever it comes to your OPEX. You know, how much am I going to be spending on solvent consumption each week, each month? And how can we find ways to recycle this solvent? And it may not even be in a closed loop system. Maybe you're using ethanol in winterization. You know, maybe that's something that you can recycle. Uh, you can re Proof, use a hygrometer and check the proofing on that, check the potency of your ethanol, see what the water levels are and, you know, redistill it so that you can reuse that for winterization or your filtration processes. There's all sorts of things on a process level that you can do to increase the sustainability and the imprint, you know, on the environment. Um, another one, too, is uh, your biomass. Yeah. You know, the biomass is a big one that I personally like to um, dive into some research and say, what can we do, you know, with this spent waste? Um, it's no longer cannabinoid laden. There's no terpenes involved anymore. We've extracted all those elements out, but it's still a botanical specimen. So there's definitely still essential amino acids. There's yep. protein. There's all sorts of things in that biomass that you can, you know, reuse, maybe um, turn it into a revenue stream if it's something that's legal. Um, there's companies that are looking at pelletizing biomass and actually having that as cattle feed. Uh, there's many studies being done um, on the impact to cattle and right now of what that's going to look like. Uh, there's been companies that will use uh, hemp biomass that's spent and dry it out and then offer that as um, an alternative to hay ah. and uh, animal bedding and different things like that because of its ability to absorb odor and all those things. So there's so many different ways that you can think about how can I minimize my impact negatively to the environment uh, with, you know, the, the materials that we're using, with the solvents that we're using, um, and then with sustainable practices within the organization, you know, how can I have a level of automation to where my uh, people aren't getting fatigued daily? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, packaging lines is a, a large concern for that. Yeah. Typically, you know, companies will uh, go very light on the automation when it comes to packaging tinctures, uh, vape carts, and you'll have 10, 12 people on a line that are literally standing there yep. with a syringe and a scale. And this position, I don't know about you, but as a scientist, pipette or thumb, it's real. It is, yeah. It is real. Uh Okay, and it will cause arthritis and all kinds of cysts right here on your um, your wrist. I've had it. It sucks. Yep. So that's something that, you know, companies have to be mindful of is, you know, how can I increase the automation so that I, I have, you know, a limited amount of people that I have to use on the process. So that's going to save me money. Yep. And then it's also going to encourage less fatigue during the process to where you don't have people who are, you know, demotivated to come to work every day to stand in front of that same section and just, you know, it, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and this is why I said, you know, you're thinking about it as not just like environmental sustainability, but business sustainability, like it's all interconnected. Um, it is. And that's what I hope people will clue into, because I think we tend to fragment these things in our minds and, um, and, lose sight of some of that value, you know, of, of ensuring that coming to work is actually not a terrible experience <laughs> for people, mm -hmm. um, exactly. that you're actually minding uh, the health of, of your employees and things. And yeah, the pipetting thing is very real. I've spent many, many days, uh, <laughs> you know, because like when you're in the analytical lab, it's like not just your final sample dilutions, but all the steps in between. No. And so you sit there, you're doing it all day for hundreds of samples. Uh, yes. You get ready to go home and you're like, I... I'm trying to move. Yeah, it's like I can't. <laughs> um, I literally have had to explain. I have gotten very uh, 
I'm not mean. I wouldn't say I'm mean. I have been classified as direct yet diplomatic. So I'll take that. I've gotten the same. But, yeah. yeah. But there have been people that will, one, if you come into an analytical lab, and this is for everyone out there, if you see a scientist back turn and they are in front of samples with pipettes in their hands, do not speak to them. They are literally trying to pipette one microliter into a mill. And if they get it wrong, then they have to start completely over. Yep. You have to be mindful of the craft and, and what level of, you know, oh, man, just yeah. detail it takes to do that. And number two, don't come into an analytical lab expecting the one oil sample you just dropped on the table to be done in five minutes. <laughs> just because the HPLC's runtime for that sample is 10 minutes, that does not account for the 40 minutes that it took to weigh out 20 milligrams, then dilute it and extract, then you have to filter it, then you have multiple dilutions at 10x, 100x, 1000x to be able to see your majors, your minors, everything in between. It is not these blenders and toasters. If I can say anything about analytical, that has been like my pet peeves when yep. people come in expecting three samples to be ready in 30 minutes. And it's it's just not possible if you want good data. That now it's possible if you want bad data. But if right, you want exactly. good, you can get data. data. You can get yeah. data. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not gonna be accurate, it's not gonna be repeatable, it's not gonna be good. <laughs> yeah, I've I've gotten folks uh, frustrated with me when they've hired me to help them with method development for their in-house analytical testing because they want to test for uh, you know, trace THC, but also abundant C B D and they want to do it in one run, one injection. Mm -mm. And I'm like, mm. I <laughs> <laughs> you're on two separate spectrums there like it's... right like I, I, I you could do it you you can get the data but mm -hmm. like are you trying to use your thc values for any sort of like legal defensibility is that what you're mm -hmm. thinking you know it's like well you know that's going to fall apart real quick when someone starts to someone knowledgeable presses you on that and uh, yeah, yeah exactly I, i'm so glad to hear you say all of these things because it's sometimes you feel alone <laughs> <laughs> <in some of> the... <laughs> no, it's a lonely world, but no, it's not. <laughs> Trust me, I understand. And, you know, honestly, on that point, too, in the hemp industry, that's so important. That's so important because we're held to that, you know, 0.3% or lower. And that number, in my opinion, is just such an arbitrary yes. number that came out of nowhere, you know, and it's, it's like, if you don't know anything about extraction, you know that you're concentrating. So you can grow it, no problem, to have 0.3% delta-9 and lower. But as soon as you put any of that biomass in an extractor, it's coming up. Yep. Everybody's sitting high. You know, and it's like, I really hope that there, there can be more conversations about this at the legislative le level that, you know, really opens the eyes up of some of these people that are giving, you know, the law down and the regulations on these numbers to, to say, hey, if there was some truth to that, if there was some some data to back, you know, why 0.3 and really show the progression of what happens to cannabinoids along the process, I think we would have so much, you know, easier of a time as an industry, but that sometimes is just so difficult. So like you said, if it's legal defensibility, you have to make sure that your analysis is on point because if not, you're you're facing fines, you're facing shutdown, you're you're facing all sorts of things, you know, when you're not at that level of detail. Yep. Yeah, and I think I think people oftentimes just assume that'll never happen, you know, that their data will mm -hmm. never go to court or whatever. And, uh, you know, when I was going through training on some of the stuff, it was pounded into my brain to just expect that everything you produce is going to go to court one day. And, you know, and mm -hmm. to pay attention to the detail. Are you going to be able to defend what you did? Is there an mm -hmm. audit trail? All these things. And so... Yeah, if any of you listening are running in-house analytical labs or anything like that, um, it the stuff really, really, really matters. Um, if you can't prove that your data is accurate, precise, repeatable, um, that your instruments are calibrated on some regular basis, mm -hmm. I mean, all these things, um, you're going to get ripped to shreds when that data goes oh, yeah. goes to court. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, to, to switch gear, not really switch gears, because I think this is all still interrelated, interconnected with the sustainability piece. So one thing I wanted to make sure to talk about before we, we end up having to wrap up here is your unique experience in the industry, because not only you're a scientist in the industry, not only you're a woman in the industry, but you're also a, a scientist woman of color in the industry. 
So yeah. I know that your experience is unique. And so I, I wanted to just carve out some time to talk about that. Like what, what has your experience been like on, on all of those levels, just as a, as a person, your unique, you know, interactions with the industry and, and everything um, that kind of goes into that. Sure. So I, you know, I've had a very unique experience like you described and, you know, it's, it just my experience in life has been interesting. Um, you know, living in the South, I lived in, um, it's a little town outside of Jacksonville. Um, I actually moved from California with my parents when I was about eight, nine years old. And we moved to this um, town, Orange Park, which was predominantly white. It was about 95, 96%. So there weren't a lot of people that looked like me in my neighborhood, in my schools, you know? And so that was a challenge just from a very young age that I was able to overcome um, rather quickly and easily just being who I am, you know, just being myself, being kind of bubble-headed and naive, but also being a bit nerdy and uh, direct about things. And, you know, I, I feel as if that experience I thought would end, you know, with childhood games, with, with uh, childhood, yeah. you know, experience. And, and I thought that that was just what happens in school and, and all these different things. But then, you know, you get into life and you start, you know, adulting and you start getting into your career. And there have been times where my career advancement um, outside of the canvas industry has been stifled because of who I am. And, you know, white males have been promoted over me that I trained oh for God. that reason. And it's like, you know, I still would have an optimistic look about it. Like, well, you know, he must have had, you know, more qualities and, and maybe he was asking for less money. You know, I don't know what it is, but it, it definitely can't be that. It can't be that I'm a woman of color. No. So then I keep moving through my life and I, you know, get into a situation where I ask for a promotion, for a promotion with my company. And I say, hey, I've, you know, gone out, I've gotten my license as a project manager. I'm already managing projects and mm -hmm. I'd like a raise. My raise should be, you know, at the time, I think it was like $50,000 and I was making 43 yeah. and I was, you know, laughed at and gaslighted and told that, you know, you're, first of all, you're not doing the work you think you are. Second of all, um, that's a construction project manager salary, and we couldn't possibly give you that. And third of all, there's clients that won't work with you. And it was just literally lies, just all of this gaslighting of why they could not advance my career for the work that I've done and the certifications that I went after personally. And so again, you know, just optimistic, just like, well, they have to have good reason. Like it, it can't be that I'm a woman of color. No, 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 no. And so then I jump into the canvas industry and my experience in the canvas industry has been both amazing mm -hmm. and extremely detrimental um, on two fronts. One, I've, it's been amazing just with all of the, the knowledge and the techniques and the labs I've been in and the people that I've had a part in mentoring and helping to grow in this industry. Um, I mean, you know, as a scientist, being in a team is, is a big deal, you know, because like you said, it can feel very lonely. It can feel very lonely sitting in front of your instrument and that's what you do. Um, but when you're able to have collaboration and be a part of a team and nerd out with each other and just like, oh my God, did you read that white paper on Delta eight extraction? You know, I can't talk about that with regular people. I try to talk about that with my husband sometimes. And he's like, dude, whatever. I'm looking on Instagram and it's like, you know, it's difficult. So for me, that's been extremely amazing that I've been able to have this network of other scientists and colleagues, you know, not only just in the companies I've worked with, but through LinkedIn, through conferences that I've gone to and spoken at. It's been amazing to have, you know, a scientific community and, and it just feels so empowering. Um, it's been amazing in the sense of travel. I yeah. mean, this industry has really taken me all over the U.S. It, I've gone, you know, globally, I've visited five European countries now within this industry, whether that's, you know, speaking on conference panels, betting equipment, um, just leisure travel, just to see what the, the scene is like. Um, it's just been amazing, you know, and I, I love to travel. I, I feel like that's just something that I've been made to do and born to do. And it's it's been really great for me in this industry. And I don't feel like I would have had those opportunities, you know, working in other traditional sure, yeah. um, scientific industries. So that's been really good. But in a detrimental sense, 
I'd have to say it's been my fight up the corporate ladder within this industry. Um, like I said, my first role coming out, I was a laboratory manager. So I was managing and directing the lab. I was underneath uh, the VP or uh, director level, um, which was under the C-level suites, sure, which yeah, is under yeah. your board of directors. Yep, yep. So I'm looking at it like an opportunity, like, okay, I can get in here, learn everything, start to grow and year over year, just kind of, you know, work my way up. And I have hit wall after wall after wall. And I have had to go and seek out other opportunities with other companies. And it can be very detrimental to my professional trajectory because, you know, what company is going to look at a resume and say, oh my God, you were only there for four months, six months, eight months. Like what's yeah. wrong with yeah. this girl? You know, but it's, it's not me. It's absolutely the culture that's being perpetuated in these companies of being inclusive and diverse but really they're not. They're just there to use you up for all of the knowledge that you have to create their IP, yep. but then kick you out of the door and say, okay, we don't need you anymore. Thanks. You, you, you suffice, you know, for what we were looking for. Um, and I, I encountered this boys club also, yeah. you know, I, you know, the higher up that I get in the boardroom, I don't see a lot of people who look like me. And I don't see a lot of women sitting around the table giving their opinions either. And so it makes my voice that much more stifled, but it's a good thing that I have a very big voice and I, you know, I can command attention whenever, you know, I've been in meetings before where uh, a men have been ignoring me, like literally in meetings, ignoring my voice. And I have had to stop and wait for them to like look up from a phone or stop chatting amongst each other. Mm -hmm. And I am that person. I'll say, okay, guys, are we finished? Do you want to see what's going on with the edible data? Do you want to see what's going on with the production plan today? Great. I'm going to need your full attention. And that doesn't, that doesn't get a good response. You know, it, it just doesn't because um, unfortunately I, I just don't know how else to say it. Sometimes my cojones may be a little bigger than some of the other cojones in the room. And so it just, it just is what it is. Um, you know, I've been victim of companies misrepresenting opportunities to me to just oh, yeah. get yeah. me to, to use me and uh, essentially get me out of the market for other competitors. Wow. I've been wow. victim of um, using me as a cheap consultant, mm -hmm. you know, essentially bringing me on with a high salary getting me to build out their facility in record time, giving them all the formulas and IP that they need. And literally my experience, I have had my badge turned off wow. at the door. Oh my God. No warning. No, Hey, we're going to fire you. Just we're done. Nothing. We're done. And that was probably the most detrimental situation in, in my experience is, you know, one, it was traumatic. It was yeah, very traumatic. Absolutely. Um, Two, I have a family, so I have two small children that I have to support, and my husband was a stay-at-home dad and, you know, doing all those things, so we lost our home, we lost our car, we lost, you know, everything, our great credit scores, like, everything about what happened in that one moment, it, it broke, it broke me down, it did, I'm not gonna lie, it broke me down, but then something really amazing, you know, when you have a relationship with God, when you're able to look at life for what it is and, and say, you know what, there's some troubles and, and trials that you'll go through. And God is never going to put anything on you that you cannot rise above, that you cannot handle. And for me, I didn't think I could handle it. I, I was very depressed for a long time. But if it wasn't for my faith, if it wasn't for the strength of my husband and his support as well, and the strength of friends and family members that took in a family of four that was homeless, you know, we didn't have anything. That's how our consulting firm was born. Wow. Our consulting firm was born out of that pain because I knew what it is I have, what it is that I can give other people and how I can speak about my individual experience to help someone else be able to, you know, really discern people during the interview process, really ask the hard questions so that you can see how they are up front yeah. and you can make that decision for yourself and say, you know what? No, these are snakes. These are spiders. I can't go work for a company like that. They're just going to use me, abuse me and throw me out the door. And, you know, because of that experience, I'm extremely grateful for it. And I'm actually grateful for all the struggles that I've had within, you know, trying to break through leadership because, you know, now, like we mentioned, I'm entertaining a 
chief scientific officer role in the UK. I'm finally going to be in that suite where I can make a difference. I can make decisions that impact the company and really use my, my knowledge base to its fullest potential. I've been approached by uh, state governments to help them curate regulations and laws on new burgeoning adult use state markets and medical markets. Um, we've been approached by universities that want me to guest lecture and teach about you know, science and, and different hemp programs. So if it was for that experience that happened to me, those people you know, just using me and essentially throwing me out like a dog, I wouldn't be where I am now. I, I wouldn't be talking with you right now. I'd probably have my head down, per, you know, planning production for the day. I, I wouldn't be able to uh, raise this awareness of the lack of diversity and inclusion, and um, you know, the just what that can look like in this industry. And I'm just, I'm so happy that it's happened because I've now, you know, focused a lot of my passions and attention to raising that awareness to you know, social equity to social justice to diversity and inclusion. I mean, I, I follow so many different associations. I, I actually have a couple that I wrote down uh, for you, but I follow uh, the National Diversity and Inclusion Cannabis Alliance. Uh, they're a huge deal in raising awareness about this. Um, there's the Minority Cannabis Business Association yeah, yeah. that they literally, all they focus on is trying to include and help educate with resources on licensing and applications and how to start your business. Um, the Florette Coalition, they're actually a coalition that's out of um, Broccoli Magazine out of the West, and they specifically band together companies to donate to uh, minority groups and um, people who are suffering from the war on drugs, people who are suffering in underserved communities. Um, there's also a company out of Colorado, Area 420. Um, he's amazing. Um, he actually is one of the largest cannabis parks where you as a um, small business can go to and purchase land and be able to own your own cultivation company and business without all of the overheads, without all of the, the hoops you have to jump through with regulations and applications. So there's so many different companies now that are focusing and targeting uh, this issue that I just feel like I'm, I'm a part of it, you know? And, and my my story is able to help in some kind of way. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's inspiring on so many different levels. And and one reason why I, I caught myself and said, really, this is still all totally interconnected with the sustainability stuff and and everything else, because um, you know, you know, it's like you mentioned, social equity, especially in the past year or so, um, has become. Just like sustainability, the uh, buzzword, mm -hmm. you know, buzz phrase, and companies recognize like, oh, we will look good if we, you know, adopt social equity programs. But it's so hard to know who's actually being genuine, who's really doing anything um, to, you know, make good on any promises that they're making. Um, and it's it's um, uh, in a lot of ways it's disgusting because yes. uh, you know companies are using a you know something that we genuinely need to be working toward and genuinely need yes. to be putting a lot of energy in because i've mentioned this before on the podcast but we're in a a weird sweet spot right now where if we can really capitalize the social equity piece into the industry right now uh, we have a good chance of biz businesses that are owned by people of color succeeding as the industry takes off when laws yes. change but if that doesn't happen in this very special period of time my concern is, well, then you have the giant companies that also are pretty much all white male board, you know, yes. uh, that are going to come in and gobble up a lot of the companies that exist and Absolutely. dominate the space. And so it's, I think there's, there should always be a sense of urgency about this, but particularly in the cannabis industry right now where we are, um, it's, it's incredibly urgent because the industry is going to change a lot, really, really. I mean, it's always changing, but it's going to go through mm -hmm. a massive, massive change really soon. Um, you know, oh, yeah. Especially as, you know, Chuck Schumer is talking about trying to consolidate legislation to try to deschedule uh, de cannabis and everything. It's like, well, that's, you know, I, I just knowing other industry and, you know, coming out of, you know, natural product stuff. And like, I know how these companies work and who runs them and everything, you know. <laughs> it's, you can see what's going to happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, un, it's unfortunate because, you know, it, it's funny that you talk about 
the disgustingness of, of being, you know, used of using that social equity piece to to gain a foothold in the market. And I, again, personally have experienced that too, where I've worked for, you know, a hemp based company uh, here in the South, and I was the face of their marketing. I was, you know, the the main person giving the tours, and I was, you know, essentially their their person, you know, their person of color to show off. And I literally, another situation, a production manager comes in underneath me, a white female, uh, but she comes in making more than me, having offers of equity in the company, all these different things, and had way less experience in the industry and less experience, period. And it just was mind blowing to me. And I told this company, I said, you know what? I'm out, you know, this is not for me. I cannot work for a company that will, you know, preach something to me and and try to keep me happy, but then show me other things of what's really, you know, going on, what's really what you want to portray to the world, but what you're not doing here internally, I won't be a part of that. And, you know, um, a lot of people don't like to go backwards, but how can we move forward if you can't look at what's happened in the past in this industry you know the hemp industry hemp period was a cash crop in america Mm -hmm. uh, long 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 ago and it started with slaves tending to hemp crops and harvesting these things and now you have 98 percent of not just hemp crops but agricultural commodities as a whole in the u.s 98 percent are owned by white people That's a huge, huge number and so disparate when you look at the 2% of people of color that do own properties, it's like, how, how, how are we not seeing that? How are we not making some sort of change there? Like it, it has to make a change, especially being that their ancestors helped to build this industry in the, in the first place. Well, that and then, you know, you mentioned the war on drugs and, you know, the disproportionate effect that that has on people of color. And I mean, as a white person, I have experienced that in Mississippi growing up, seeing people, Mm -hmm. you know, when I was experimenting with cannabis, I was able to get away with things that other people didn't. And, you know, I saw it with my own eyes uh, how a white person would be treated by a judge, you know, with the exact same charge, you know, simple possession charge or whatever, slap on the wrist, like you know, okay, don't do it again, blah, blah, blah. But a person of color comes up, you know, with the exact same situation, same charge and everything. And it's almost certain that they're going to jail. I mean, it's yeah. just like, that's just, it, it, you know, it's not just something that we talk about. It's something I've witnessed um, throughout yeah. my life. And so thinking about that and how long the war on drugs has been going on and these dynamics that have been going on, not to mention I also, my grandfather was uh, in the Jackson, Mississippi police force, and I'm well aware of the rampant racism that runs through police departments. Mm -hmm. People cannot like that. You know, some people don't really want to acknowledge that, but police departments in general have a long history of racism too. So there's there's these dynamics that have really come into place that have, you know, taken people disproportionately out of, out of uh, the industry, out of opportunity. And and then now, you know, like you said, there are organizations that are, are trying to really like get this going, mm-hmm. get people out of jail, get people in ownership positions of companies, yeah. like get this reiterate. But it's, it's so, the problem is hard to fathom. And, you know, like mentioning that number, yeah. the 98% number, like that's hard for people to digest. And I mean, it's, um, it's, it doesn't seem real. And I think that's maybe yeah. a problem because it makes it easier for people to um, dissociate from yeah, the problem. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's there. It's pretty disparate too on the investment side. You know, I, I spoke about this on a previous podcast that I've done, and you know, eighty one to eighty two percent of campus companies, specifically on the cultivators and the processor side, are Caucasian owned yeah. and male owned. And that's a huge piece. And, you know, less than 5% of investment goes into specifically African-American hands. 
you know, to be able to start up companies. So that's something too, that's just, you know, I love talking about it because then people are like, wow, I didn't know, like I, this is a big deal, you know? And, and as that buzz starts to really, you know, go around, then it'll hit the right ears. And then those ears will start to, you know, actually have action and change. You know, you speak about your experience in Mississippi, you know, I, I lived in Florida yeah. and it's funny because my husband was actually talking about this on a podcast, his specific experience. And, you know, he was driving around Jacksonville and he had like a little joint with him, you know, just kind of enjoying his, his uh, weekend and he gets pulled over and the cop was essentially like, Oh, throw it out. You know, don't, don't let me catch you out here again like this and slap on the wrist. You know, he gets to drive and, and go home. But then his best friend, who's a black male, who is a patient here in Florida, he is a patient and has a medical card, got pulled over. The police officer saw his vape cartridge that was in the, the cup holder and asked him what it was. And he said, yes, this is my medical marijuana. Here's my card. He got taken to jail. Wow. He got taken to jail. And it's it just, it blows my mind. And, and my husband is one of the biggest advocates for this because of, you know, the experiences that he's, he's had personally. Mm -hmm. And then the contrast with a lot of the people who's close to him yep. uh, that are his friends or, you know, people, members of my family. And it's just something that, you know, I love our dynamic, you know, as a team, because we're able to experience life. Uh, we, we have very different experiences yeah. in life, you know, being married together. And I've had situations where, my six-year-old daughter has come into the room crying to us one time and she was like, you know, daddy, I really love mommy. And sometimes I worry about her, you know, just going to yeah. work or, or driving and, you know, cause she's brown. And I worry about you, daddy, because you love her. And oh it's like, oh my yeah. God, right? It's like my six-year-old shouldn't be worrying about, you know, social impact and issues like that. You know, I don't worry about it. I always give my stuff to God. And I'm like, you know what? I have this bubble of safety around me. I'm usually doing the right thing. Like I'm not even a consumer at this point. Like I just work in the field. And it's, it's just one of those things where, it, it's, it breaks my heart how many families have been affected uh, by what goes on, you know, while this industry is still moving forward at the speed of light and people are making millions and millions of dollars. There's literally hundreds and thousands of people being locked up for the same product that's putting money yeah. in the pockets of other people. And that has to change. It has to change quickly, like really fast. Yeah. And I mean, what you're pointing out is that even when laws change, when a medical program is instituted or whatever, uh, often people have the sense that, oh, okay, they decriminalize, they legalize, whatever. So that problem has gone away, you know. Um, and this example you mentioned is just a perfect highlight of how, no, it continues. It continues even when laws have changed, even when, you know, that person should have felt completely safe. They had their card. I mean, like, they're a patient. I mean, that's what the program is for. Um, but you know, and I, I, I'm glad you told that story because I hope that that's going to help things click a little bit for people to understand that it's, it's not just a legal issue. You, like, it's not just about changing laws. I mean, this is a cultural societal thing that, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you have people that are enforcing regulations for enforcing laws and stuff and, um, and they demonstrate that they cannot, um, you know, handle their role in an objective way, they should not be in that role. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, um, and you, you can't just rely on the fact that the laws have changed to, to fix the problem. And something that's disturbed me is the lack of, uh, as states are legalizing, there are a couple of that have paid attention to this, but for the most part, not many of them are talking about letting people out of jail, clearing up yeah. people's records. And something I try to highlight a lot, you, you know, prior to, you know, whenever, uh, but certainly through the 70s, 80s, 90s, if you went to jail for cannabis, I mean, even if you're out now, like, good luck getting a loan, a business loan, good luck, yeah. getting, you know, financial aid, if you want to go back to school, you know, yeah. there's all of this baggage that comes with your arrest. And if yeah. states aren't thinking about how they're going to take care of, of the people that have been uh, severely impacted by this, because that's, that's, you know, all of this interconnected stuff. You have the war on drugs that's disproportionately affecting people of color. They go to jail. They can't get loans. They can't get student aid. You know, that 
these are the systemic things that keep yes. people, even if they're not in jail, that keep them from being able to, you know, get into the system and actually play the game. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, absolutely. It's uh, yeah. It's and I'm happy that there are are, you know, associations popping up for that too. You know, you do have uh, the Last Prisoner Project yeah, that's yeah. really working hard and doing meaningful, meaningful work on really trying to expedite these processes for people. You have, um, you know, real social equity programs that are setting aside funds and licenses for people who have been incarcerated before for this. You know, I've seen it in California. Um, Oakland has been like a really big city yeah. of doing it. And it's just... If we can look at that and look at that progress and perpetuate that across, you know, the borders across the coast and really start to implement some of those programs that are doing that meaningful work, you're going to see a big change. You're going to see a lot of people start to penetrate the market and be able to, you know, just gain a sense of self and where it's been kind of taken and stripped away. And like you said, a lot of those moments it, it isn't just the moment of being arrested and being in jail, being incarcerated. It's after too. It's your entire life. It's your family's lives. Yep. You know, it's it's all the people that are impacted around that one uh, instance and situation. So it's just such a serious, um, you know, conversation to be had. And I'm just really happy that there's so many people um, now in the industry and outside of the industry that are starting to have these conversations on a regular basis. Yeah, and to and to share these stories. I mean, I think it's the you know, like I said, when people actually hear, you know, not just the abstract, but the direct things that people have experienced, um, that really brings it home. Um, or at least that's my hope. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we can all hope. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's only so much you can do. Some people, you just you know, it's just not going to get through. Um, well, coming coming around from from all of that and and the weight of all of that to lighten up the the ending here um uh, i always like to ask especially science scientists guests that i have i always like to ask what are other things that you're passionate about besides just extraction and and the stuff that you've been doing now i mean you're you're a person so i know you have all sorts of interests so to sure. to start to wrap things up tell me about something that you're passionate about beyond everything we've we've talked about today so specifically two things are starting to pop up and really, really pique my interest. Uh, one of those has been these amazing looking cannabis bed and breakfast. <laughs> I think yes. that is just yes. genius. It just makes so much sense. It, you know, I've, I'm seeing them pop up in um, adult use states like Maine, uh, you know, Oregon and their, you know, destination places already. But then you add this bed and breakfast, you know, to it where you can, you know, have infused meals at dinner or you have a small dispensary that's on site where you can go and you can buy products and, you know, have happy consumption throughout your, your trip there. I think that is awesome. I think that would raise so much positivity in people's lives. It'll increase the quality of people's lives to just be able to relax um, that was something that I enjoyed going up to Canada mm. and being able to, you know, consume freely and, and just really enjoy my time. Um, that's, you know, a big piece is, is the social stigma yep. and also just the, the nerves, you know, the nervousness of something that was previously, previously prohibited and now is just, you know, open. Yep. So I really am very interested in seeing these, um, you know, companies like Fed and Breakfasts pop up, uh, some of the infused restaurants where you yeah. go for an experience yeah. and you have, you know, your, your appetizer, your dinner, your dessert. And, um, there was actually a show, I forget if it was on Netflix or one of these streaming services, but there was a show where you had a panel of these celebrities and they would you know have these three chefs and they would cook yeah. and do all these infused meals and it was hilarious i think it was like called toasted or something like that yeah was was um guy <laughs> obelum on that uh he he was on one of these cooking ca cannabis shows as you know sort of like the recurring comedian that was on there and i always like a lot of the stuff that that he does but i'm pretty sure I, i've watched the show you're yeah. talking about it's fascinating just to see it is uh, you know that things have come this far it is. It's awesome. And it's such a great way to, to just have that community sense, you know, yeah. like that, that feeling of family and being able to really enjoy each other. Um, another thing on the scientific side that I've been super interested in has been um, not just extraction and the advancement of the different methodologies, but um, formulations. Oh, the, yeah. the products have just really mature 
past where we were two decades ago. You know, we, we were specifically looking at tinctures, capsules, vape carts, yeah. joints, you know, yeah. flour. Mix and, and that was about MCT oil. Yeah, that, that was it. <laughs> and you had specifically THC, CBD. That was it. And now you're really starting to see the market in product consumption change and the consumer is really starting to mature. Um, like myself, you know, I like to use myself as studies when I'm formulating products and things like that, because I don't want to formulate something that's going to give me an adverse effect and then yeah. put that on the market. and It's going to hurt someone. Yep. So, uh, you know, being a woman, we go through, you know, there's women with endometriosis, yep. with um, multiple dysmenorrhea, with all sorts of different things that are associated with childbirth, uh, menstrual pain, sexual pain, um, just different things like that. And I've started to see this huge uptick in topicals. And I'm extremely excited about the growth of where infused topicals are going. Um, I suffer with IBS and I uh, actually created a salve um, that has CBD uh, primarily. And I will use that with a carrier oil and actually rub it in my belly button. Mm. If I'm having um, issues with bloating or if there's you know something I've had an adverse effect to something I've eaten and it really works, it really does. Um, I've also looked into um, creating suppositories yeah, uh, yeah. for menstrual pain and for um, sexual health as well, because some, you know, people don't talk about it, yep. but sometimes, you know, that's a big piece of um, anxiety for, for uh, the human experience yep. is uh, sexual pain or um, issues there. And, you know, there's now companies coming out with infused lubricants, mm -hmm. with uh, suppositories, with um, just different things to be able to incorporate the cannabinoid um, benefits to every part of our bodies. So I've been very interested and had my eye on a lot of the new developments in product formulation and where it's going. Absolutely. That's, it's something that's been fascinating me too. I mean, I saw, so my, my alma mater is the University of Mississippi and I'm always following stuff that they're doing, but I saw that, um, um, uh, Dr. El Soli that runs the NIDA cannabis lab at Ole Miss, uh, they come up with, uh, like, uh, THC eye drops, um, nice. so to, to get that localized delivery to the blood vessels right there in mm -hmm. the eye. And this idea of like, how do we get cannabinoids where we want them specifically where we want them? Um, that's really, really been on my mind lately, especially as mm -hmm. I teach, I teach about the endocannabinoid system a lot. And one of the things that I tell people that a lot of times they hadn't heard before is that the endocannabinoid system isn't one thing. And mm -hmm. what's going on in different tissues and cells, it can vary. The endocannabinoid tone of different parts of your body can differ. And so that, that localized delivery uh, is very, very important to a lot of people, Absolutely. depending on what they're dealing with. The belly button thing, I'm very fascinated by that. Because as soon as you said that, I started to think about it. And I was like, hmm, like just thinking about what the belly button is. And, how, you know, I'm like, You're right. Oh, that's, that's actually <laughs> a really, really good idea. Uh, I got the idea from... Um... I was looking at, I was looking online and I believe it was either uh, doTERRA or one of those oil companies. And I'm, I'm a huge enthusiast of, uh, you know, diffusing oils. I'm vegan vegetarian. So we're always doing some natural homeopathic things. Yeah, sure. And I was looking and I was like, okay, if I have digestive issues, then obviously my tummy is where I need the topical to go. And then I was reading about it and it looked like I could increase the bioavailability if I went through my belly button. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, let's try this out and see what happens. And sure enough, like I was having a really bad attack that night. Like it literally felt like the best way to describe it was being in labor again with having a baby. And it was absolutely excruciating. And I went and put this, you know, concoction right there on my belly button. About 40 minutes in is when I started to feel some relief. And then I, I put some more and then I was able to finally, you know, just go to sleep. And I was like, light bulb. Oh my God. Like I need to go ahead and like start, you know, marketing this. <laughs> yeah. I, but you know, I'm not worried about like IP patents and all this stuff. I just really feel like uh, uh, everyone out there should be able to gain uh, knowledge from, from data, from, you know, these yeah. studies that people do with it, with their own selves and with other people. I just think that's, what's going to push the industry forward. Yeah, I totally agree. I've, I've gotten roped into some projects uh, before where folks have wanted to patent formulations and develop like really formalized IP and stuff. And um, yeah, I always start to feel weird about it. I'm like, I, you know, how are you, how are you planning on using it? You know, yeah. you, try, you know, there's always patent trolls out there that are just trying to keep other people from doing things. And mm -hmm. ultimately I'm like, I understand the role of patents and everything and the protection, but at the same time, they can really be 
detrimental to just progress and you know, yeah and access you know it can be prohibitive yeah. it really can yeah well i think on the belly button note i think that's the perfect place to wrap up i'm <laughs> sure that people listening have probably i mean i had not heard that so i know there are other people out there that hadn't heard that too and it's always great to learn new things so i'm gonna definitely try that uh awesome super super fascinating uh, well alicia thanks so much for being willing to take the hour and 20 minutes or so here I knew our conversation was going to be good based on the call we had before. Um, but I'm super stoked to follow, you know, what you guys do in the future and, and to see how, um, you know, the company that your husband and you have, uh, see how it grows and, and evolves. And, and then this, this potential UK work, that's going to be very, very fascinating. So, um, yeah, I look forward to staying in touch and, and definitely wish you the best in everything that you're doing. Thank you so much, Jason. And really thank you for your time. It's been uh, equally pleasurable for me on this side. I just, I feel like I can keep talking to you all day long, but I appreciate your time so much. And I thank you for exposing me to all of your listeners today. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, down the road, as things develop, if you have stuff you want to talk about, don't hesitate to reach out. I'll always be happy to bring you back on. So we'll do. Um, we'll do. So with that, everybody, um, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. As always, if you want to learn more about Curious About Cannabis or find other episodes, you can go to CACpodcast.com or hunt for us on social media. We're all over the place. Just search for Curious About Cannabis and you should find us. So thanks so much for tuning in. Stay curious and take it easy. Bye-bye. We must work untiringly so that our children are obliged, obliged to learn the truth. Because it is only through knowledge, knowledge, knowledge that we can safely protect. You're listening to the Curious About Cannabis Podcast. 